right. Well, thank you everybody uh, for coming today. I know we're in the middle of a Thursday, so I really appreciate you taking time to come out, um, even if it is virtually. It's great to see everyone here and to see interest um, in knitting. So that's it's really great. Um, my name is Daniel. I'm a librarian here at Los Gatos Library. Um, and uh, again, I'm recording this program, only my video, uh, but your voice could be included in a recording. Um, if you'd like to type questions, you're welcome to, and I won't name anyone's full name, um, and I will splice it up a little bit so it's not just the, the raw recording, but just so you're aware um, that I'll be doing that. Uh, and again, if you just came in, there's a view button. If you want to change the view for it to not just be me, you're welcome to do that so you can see everybody. Um, thank you to Silicon Valley Reads 2021. Uh, it's very exciting to see all of the programs that have been able to be organized. Even if they are all virtual, it's been uh, excellent to all come together around the theme of connecting. Um, I thought uh, knitting would be a great way to connect with others, uh, as many people have traditionally had um, knitting circles where they share community, but also just um, learning from each other and learning new skills and uh, just generally having uh, a nice little circle of people to hang out with. Um, I definitely recommend, if you haven't already, looking at the Silicon Valley Reads uh, calendar of events. There's a bunch of programs from uh, libraries all over the South Bay and Silicon Valley um, and all around the theme of connecting. Some really cool book clubs and book talks and other great ways to connect, um, especially in the times we're in. Uh, it's, it's a great time to be able to connect with people. That's something that uh, we're all missing is that uh, connection with strangers that we actually used to uh, get a lot out of before uh, the pandemic. So, so um, thank you all for coming together uh, today to do some crafting. It's uh, very exciting. I love being able to do this at work um, and it's been uh, great to see so much interest from the community in general. Um, so uh, obviously I like knitting. <laughs> um, I've, I've, I'm a pretty novice knitter. I'm very uh, amateur, sorry. I'm quite an amateur. Uh, I've knit quite a few things, but um, I like to keep it simple because I do it mostly for stress relief and just uh, generally learning something new, just my own lifelong learning there. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to share what I know, which is again, not super advanced, uh, but, I, but I can help figure more advanced stuff out. I know where to look and how to understand what's written out there. So if you have questions as we go along, please feel free to, to um, unmute yourself and, and ask me or type it in the chat. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, uh, so, and also you're also welcome to have your camera on if you'd like, but again, no pressure. Um, so I'll also pass out a little a survey at the end of this. I'll put it in the chat and then I'll also email it to everybody who registered today. Um, and that is just to see if anyone's interested in doing this once a month. Um, no commitment. You can just say what your availability is and whether you're interested or uh, yeah, if you'd like to fill that out. So we can have an idea if that's something that people would actually enjoy um, putting together because we can offer our Zoom account for that and have one of us uh, be a part of that. So um, I'll send that out. So look forward to that link. And remember, as we dive into this, um, for some people, maybe it's a skill you've had in the past and are trying to refresh. Maybe uh, you actually know quite a bit, but you just want to hang out with others doing it, or uh, you don't know anything about knitting at all. And so um, I'm trying to capture all of those people with this program, but obviously we're all going to come in at different experience levels and different abilities. So um, be easy on yourself. Uh, be nice to yourself and others who are here. Um, no questions are dumb questions. Uh, all all questions are worth answering. There's a good chance that if you have a question about it, someone else does. Um, and, and knitting really is an experience. So um, it's, it's something that you really get good at by doing over and over, which means that you will definitely make mistakes. Um, there will be things that are hard for you, other things that will be easy for you. So um, just remember that going into it, uh, try not to get frustrated, just remember Yarn is very forgiving. Uh, you can undo it, you can redo it several times. Um, and I'll touch on that a little bit in a sec, but we're gonna start with the basics today. So um, 
we're really just going to figure out how to get started. Um, and then we can build on that in the future if you'd like, or I'm also here for questions if you have more advanced questions. Um, so I thought I'd just start by saying, uh, by answering the question of what is knitting, which is, um, it is really the art of tying knots, making loops with yarn um, to then create some piece of fabric. So uh, what that looks like is a shirt like this, socks or anything else that's just knit together into knots, one row on top of the other until you build a garment. Um, and so the oldest piece of fabric, I think that they've found uh, that they're sure was knit as from the 11th century in Egypt. But um, given how complex that knitting was, there's a, a very good chance it's much older than that. That's just the oldest artifact that they're certain they've been able to find. Um, and from, from the Middle East, it uh, spread through trade or um, just through the movement of people to parts of Europe and then um, all over the world. Uh, so the, the popularity here was really, uh, it's, it's gone in waves. Um, obviously during the wars, there was a huge effort from people here at home um, to knit and send things to people on the front lines during the wars, uh, both World War I and World War II. There were a lot of knitting groups that um, came together to, to actually make garments for soldiers. Um, but since then, beyond the manufacturing side of machines that knit for us, like these clothes, um, it's really potentially gone out of style as people stopped having to make their own clothes and has come back recently as quite a trend. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of fancy knitting out there. There's a lot of different people with different techniques that um, have been developed over thousands of years, obviously, but also some newer things given the new materials that are out there um, to knit with. And so I thought I would just kind of dive into the tools that um, we have. We do have the knitting kits that you can check out at the library. We have um, 15, so we don't have lots and lots, uh, but we do have, yeah, awesome. We do have several, and so they, they will circulate pretty fast. I totally recommend checking one out. You'll get a little something to keep. Um, and uh, it's just it's just fun. You can always rewatch this video if you'd like to or follow any other resources that I'll share to learn more. But it's a, it's a great place to start. Um, I'm just gonna show you what that is in case you don't have it. Let me turn this background off real quick. So um, what we have here is a pair of knitting needles. Sorry, this really wants to focus automatically. Um, this pair of knitting needles is a uh, size, it's a seven millimeter, uh, which I think translates to, cool, wow, an 11 or a 12. Um, and so basically when you see a knitting needle and you see a number on it, it's telling you the circumference. So if I have a seven millimeter um, needle, it's seven millimeters around, and that's gonna determine how big my loops are. Because obviously I can't make anything <laughs> smaller than seven millimeters if I've wrapped the yarn around a seven millimeter um, tube. Uh, so as you're knitting, you'll start to notice if you use different sizes of needles that depending on whether you've got a seven or well, let's call it a 12 or a 15, um, or so you have something giant, something mi medium size or something extra small, you're gonna get a different size of fabric that comes out of your knitting. Um, it's really according to taste. It's easier to learn on bigger needles just because again, there's more room, uh, there's more yarn to work with um, it's a little more spread out and you can knit a little bit looser. So it's easier to get into the yarn with the needles. Um, but any size will work, obviously. Um, I also wanted to mention um, they go up in half millimeter sizes. So you'll have like a seven, a seven and a half, eight. And each one of those sizes in the US is a, a full different size. So. If a size seven is an 11, then a seven and a half is a 12. Um, so beyond the needles, we have yarn, obviously. Um, 
the the yarn that I have in these kits isn't what I would call the fanciest yarn. Um, there are there are deluxe yarns. There are um, uh, yarns that you can find like at Michaels or any craft store, and they all kind of have their own benefits. Um, this the I chose this yarn mostly because it's inexpensive. It's a it's an inexpensive way to enter into it. Um, you don't have to work with expensive things to have a, a successful knitting project. Um, but there are tons of types of yarn uh, that vary from animal yarn. So like uh, wool, like sheep's wool or alpaca. Um, you also have plant-based yarns. So that's like uh, hemp or um, cotton. And then you also have synthetic yarns like this. So this is acrylic. And I kind of just wanted, and, and really what type you choose will depend, again, what you're trying to make. A lot of patterns uh, are specific. So um, if you want your item to come out exactly as the pattern says, then you'll want to use exactly the type of yarn that they uh, used when they made the pattern. However, um, as you'll see with the pattern that we're working on today, this is not the correct type of yarn for that pattern, but the pattern itself is easy enough to follow that it gives you a really good start. So um, it's kind of fun to mix and match yarns with patterns just to see how they come out. Um, I also wanted to kind of show you how to figure out what type of yarn you're working with. Um, sometimes patterns can be, uh, can have a lot of information <laughs> and too much information that gets very confusing. So I just wanted to kind of walk through what is actually on this tag. Um, and so it says it's 100% acrylic, uh, which again is a synthetic material. Um, it's also got this three and 50 grams. Uh, this isn't going to be on every ball of yarn, but the three basically is telling you what, what type of weight it is. And it's repeated right here. Number three, DK light worsted. And I'll show you a chart in just a second to make that make a little more sense. But this is a fairly lightweight yarn. Um, if you go for a range from one to 10 or one to seven, um, three is a pretty lightweight yarn, uh, not too bulky. Uh, and used for, you know, something that you don't want the yarn to be obviously popping out when you knit it. Um, the grams is literally the weight. So this is 50 grams for 109 yards. And so some patterns, again, will be specific about the weight of the yarn versus as, uh, with the yardage. And if you don't match those things together, which I will also show you with a project I'm working on now, um, it will come out different <laughs> than the pattern says. So it's just another thing to kind of keep in mind. Um, it, it's not mandatory that you get the same type of yarn, but if you are trying to go for something in a pattern very specifically, then this is important to pay attention to. Um, and again, just the, the weight of yarn. And I'm just gonna share my screen real quick and show you um, just a an, an description of what these yarn weights look like. Um, you start with uh, very fine yarn. This would be lace weight. Um, so if you've seen anyone do lace work or um, yeah, baby yarn or fingering yarn is what it's called. Uh, that's kind of like this. And I'll show you in a sec when I'm not sharing, but <clears throat> much lighter weight yarn. Um, then it goes up to a fine. So sport is a very popular um, weight. And then at three, you get DK light worsted. And that's exactly what this is. Um, and then as you get bulkier and bulkier, the numbers go up. Um, the most common would be like a worsted weight yarn. And let me just stop sharing and I can show you. I've got a couple skeins here. Um, this is yarn that I bought at the Black Squirrel Berkeley's uh, website. And um, they've done their own dye on it, but this is a pretty light sock. So um, this is a, uh, fingering weight yarn. So one of the lighter yarns, just a little bit bigger than lace. Um, so you'd have to knit on pretty small needles or else you'll have big holes. This is um, closer to a worsted weight. I don't, I don't remember the exact weight, but you can see that it's much chunkier. Um, if you put this on the same size needle, it's going to have a different type of outcome. So if I knit this on these giant needles, I'm obviously going to have a uh, really big webby holes. But if I start to knit with this on this needle, the 
those holes will get a little bit smaller, be a bit more filled in. And then if I go a big chunkier size larger, you'll start to get a more full um, knit. And I can actually show you <laughs> what knitting with that and bigger needles looks like. I knit this little fingerless glove that I haven't sewn up yet um, that where I've used different colors, but you can see even between this yarn and this yarn, which are very different weights, um, it, it really is 3D, it pops out. It's a lot of knitters would <laughs> call this not super well done, especially because of my color on the back. I didn't, this was my first time doing this. So, um, uh, but it, it is kind of cool, but you can definitely tell the difference of weight um, when you've used the same needles for a different weight of yarn. All right, let me, let me pop up here real quick. Um, the other things I wanted to mention, and I'm still on the wrong video here, are um, the tapestry needle. So if anyone's done any sewing at all by hand, um, you'll know what a sewing needle looks like. The tapestry needles are just a little bit bigger. Um, they, they allow for bigger yarn to fit through. You can usually pull something pretty big through these. And then um, when you start and finish a project, you'll have big long tails on the, on the beginning and the end that you'll have to weave in. Um, and even though it's all tied up, you don't, you can't really cut uh, the end of your, your final knot or else if it ever comes undone, it's gonna unravel. Uh, so you do take a few inches and weave that into the backside of the project. Um, so these can be very helpful for doing that. Also, if you find any mistakes, you can weave, you can sew in some extra yarn. Um, and then I have stitch markers here and stitch markers really uh, are exactly what they sound like. A lot of patterns um, will recommend that you use them when it's getting kind of complicated. So an example with something that I've knit, um, this tank top, if you, if I didn't remember where the center was, um, because I knit it in, uh, I think I knit this in the round. So I knit this in a circle. And if I didn't tell myself where the middle was, I might not remember uh, when to start the ribbing. And that's what these rows are called, ribbing. So um, putting a stitch marker here reminded me that for the next few rows, I do this type of stitch. And when I get back to it, I need to do it again. Um, so the sti stitch markers help you keep your place. Uh, they, they literally just fasten into the middle of a project. You can hook them pretty much anywhere. Um, and they, they help keep your place that way and you can knit right around them. And then finally, just measuring tape. Um, I just have measuring tape here because for a lot of more advanced projects, they do recommend uh, doing a gauge swatch, which is literally just um, knitting out a four by four uh, square, uh, almost uh, smaller than this obviously, but just about this size so that you can see what your final outcome will actually be. Um, and it can be really, really life-saving if you don't want to undo a project, uh, especially for something that's fitted like a shirt or a sweater, um, or even if you need a scarf to fit a certain way, um, it can be good to knit a square first and then undo it. But just so you know what it's actually going to look like when you knit it out with your needles and your yarn. Um, and I just wanted to show you just a range of, of sizes of needle and yarn. Um, on, with a couple of projects that I've done. So this is a tie. It's just a regular necktie um, that I've made and it's nothing special, but it is on very, very small needles. It's uh, fingering weight yarn on size ones. Uh, so the, basically the smallest size you can get, um, sorry, the, the dark red is kind of hard to see on camera, but um, it's a very fine seed stitch and I'll also go over what the stitches are, but um, yeah, looks nice. But that's what really small yarn on really small needles will produce for you. And kind of going up, this tank top um, was on, I think these were size, um, I didn't write it down. I think it was size six needles, also with the same weight of yarn here, um, which made it kind of airier. Um, but the ribbing also allows it to stretch. So it'll fit a range of sizes because um, 
this ribbing holds a lot of uh, a lot of yarn. And then as you kind of go up, um, this is a little bit bigger. This is a shawl that I've made while <laughs> in quarantine. Um, and so this is, again, it's yarn a little bit, uh, basically the size of yarn that we're using today um, that are in the kits, this DK weight, um, and about size eight needles. So this is a, a fairly regular sized, as far as the stitch sizes, um, a pretty normal sized garment, kind of like what most scarfs will knit out as. Um, and then uh, just wanted to show you what I'm working on right now, um, which is a sweater. And so this sweater is on size six needles, um, also with the DK worsted, but I'm about halfway through and it'll fit something like this. Um, and so this, again, I knit pretty tight because <laughs> I do this for stress relief. So I'm often pulling pretty hard on my yarn, which gives it kind of a tighter, um, tighter look but uh, overall it's still a pretty medium sized knit. And then finally, just so you can see something a little chunkier, this headband, um, there's the light. Uh, this headband is like size 10 needles with worsted weight yarn, um, pretty common. Uh, worsted weight's really nice because it's, it's usually less, in it, less expensive for animal fibers and um, pretty easy to find and you can use pretty much uh, any size needle above a six that and it work, comes out pretty well. This is a lot of information. So does anybody have any questions or anything you'd like answered about tools or types of yarn? And feel free to unmute yourself too if you. You had a gauge there. Um, so I got the kit because I've never knitted. Mm -hmm. um, and the recipe or the pattern calls for a certain size, but I don't see how that matches up. Like, I think these are the eight millimeter, but then it, is there a, a gauge that you can use? Um, you can tell what number it is. So you'll see on the needles that you have, there's a very, it's not, it's not the easiest to, oh, maybe they don't, that might be. So I bought this tool specifically so I could um, figure out what sizes these were. Okay. Uh, Cause so they don't always print them on. There's a good chance. And yes, I will share, I can, I'm happy to share a PDF of the sizes. Um, uh, okay. There are these little tools. I, I don't have them for the kits, but I will probably actually get some um, that you can literally just stick the needle through and figure out what size it is. Um, but uh, typically, if, if um, I don't know a great way to find out other than to wrap the measuring tape around it and see how many millimeters it is. Um, otherwise, uh, you can see the, in the kit itself, there are these metal, um, these metal needles with the silver band. And then there's the metal needles with the colorful bands. The colorful bands should have the size printed on them. Um, and you can compare. Uh, yeah, I, tr I tried to give three sizes that were all a little bit different in the kits. Um, and those, uh, those either came like, it was like three, six, nine, or like uh, five, seven, 10. I, I tried to give kind of a, a range of needles in there. Um, as for today, for the, the pattern that's in that kit and that we're gonna look at today, I wouldn't worry too much about uh, it matching exactly. Um, I chose that pattern one because it's it's free um, and it also just um, uh, is really forgiving. It, whatever you knit out of that pattern is going to look the same kind of basically de depending on what size you use. Um, the stitches will look a little different, but it'll turn out basically the same. Um, this is, yeah, this is Archna. So if you didn't get the kit, which I haven't gotten yet, um, and you can get uh, needles like at, at Michael's or Hobby Lobby or, you know, Joanne's or whatever, a lot of them come, if they're not with the band on it, they come with the number on it. So if you ever wanted to go invest in your own needles, <laughs> this is the only way I can keep track. <laughs> and yeah. so some of them come with like, you know, I've got like a bigger one you know, that has the name, the number on it. It has both the millimeters and the US 
measurements on it. So sometimes that's easier. But the question that I had for you, Daniel, is does it make a difference whether you have the needles with the cord attached to it or whether you have it separated? Uh, no, it doesn't. Um, and, and I just wanted to let you know, Christine, I see your hand and I'll call you in a second. Um, it, it doesn't it doesn't matter for this. Uh, the, the cable is helpful for other types of projects. Um, uh, what we're doing today is called knitting flat, which is basically you knit a row and then you flip it over and you knit it again. So you just build it up um, literally flat, like a big, big long rectangle. Um, however, if you were to knit something like this headband or um, that, that tank top, you would knit it in, a, in the round. And what that means is like, as I go around, I'm actually just knitting back into it again. So I might do 30 stitches and then I, I literally just keep circling it in and I knit into that next row, which again is where a stitch marker would help. Um, I might knit one and drop a stitch marker and then I'll go around and knit 29. And then as I get to the stitch marker, I know that I'm starting a new row. Um, and, and keeping a notepad uh, with a pen is really helpful. Um, I, I like to take some pretty intense notes uh, <laughs> as I'm doing my stuff because it's really easy to lose track with a more complicated project. But even with this project, you'll wanna, you'll wanna count to make sure you have 14 stitches. You'll wanna count to make sure you know about how many rows you've gone. That way you can measure um, and see, oh, after 10 rows, it's four inches. Uh, I can expect that at 20 rows, it'll be, tw it'll be eight inches long. Um, that way you can kind of just keep track that way. But this is really useful, mostly when you're working on a project, if you take a break, <laughs> uh, you can just slip it onto the cable so it doesn't fall off the needles. That's mostly why I included this type in the kits, um, but they are pretty versatile. There are fancier, um, for anyone investing in like a, a, a lifelong, knitting kit, um, I like you have these that have, uh, I, I, you can actually screw off the needles and replace it with a different size. So you have several different lengths of cable and several different sizes of needles all in one kit. So they're interchangeable. But that way, if I wanted to start knitting for some reason in with another size of needle, I could just pop these needles off, pop new needles on and kind of change the gauge completely on my project. Um, but yeah, mostly mostly for safety, mostly just to, to stop the frustration, but also allow you to do other projects if you're trying to do something more advanced. Um, Christina, did you, oh, I answered your question. Yeah, you answered my question. I wanted to know what the difference between regular needles and the one with the cord. So thank you. Well, cool. And then um, I'm seeing Carol, I see your comments. Um, I will, I'll share the, the chart with the yarn weights um, and needle sizes. And the store that I bought this yarn from, I like, I like them a lot. I'm not sponsoring anybody, but um, the Black Squirrel in Berkeley. Um, they have an online shop that I've been using during, during all this. <laughs> uh, so it's been really nice uh, to be able to shop without having to go to a store. Um, yeah, they're the Black Squirrel. There are several, several yarn stores in the Bay Area. Um, imagine it in San Francisco. Um, if someone can remind me the name of the store in Los Altos. Uh, I can't think of it off the top of my head, um, but there are several, several yarn shops. And then here in town, we have, um, boy, I just should have come with the names ready. Uh, we have the craft store here in town. There's Fillery's in Campbell, I think. Fillery's mm -hmm. yarn. Yes. <clears throat> yes. And I think Affordable Treasures is what I was thinking. They also have yarn and needles and such on the Scottish Boulevard. Um, yeah. Does anyone have any questions? I think uh, the next thing we're going to do is really start. So I'm, I'm happy to answer any other questions before we get started. One last question. Um, since I didn't pick up the uh, kit, is it, are we still working on the infinity scarf? Yep. Yeah, I was just going to use that as an example, um, but I'm also happy to demo any other stitches once we get those. Well, it's got some pretty thick needles that they talked about US 19. And so I was just wondering since everyone else had smaller needles, does it matter? It doesn't matter. Um, and okay. what, what we actually work on today is not gonna, it's not gonna look like what that pattern looks like. Nearly impossible to find an affordable yarn that matches a free pattern, <laughs> honestly. Um, so I went with kind of a standard size yarn 
um, a kind of standard pattern that you can play with um, and, and make your own depending on the type of yarn and needles you have. Um, but just to give you an example of what, of what uh, a pattern looks like, that's kind of easier to read. Fillery yarn, ah, Uncommon Threads, thank you. Uncommon Threads is the store in Los Altos. Um, cool. Okay, so let me go ahead. Um, again, if you have any questions as we go, please feel welcome to, to chime in. Um, I'm just gonna open this page. I'm gonna share my screen real quick so you can see how I found this, um, this pattern. Um, on, on the website Ravelry, which um, is having a few issues now with accessibility as far as reading their screen. So I apologize if this is hard to see, but um, so, so this was a free pattern. I, I really just searched for knitting, for scarf patterns um, that are knitting. Uh, I tried to go by yardage because we have about 106 yards in this ball of yarn and then free. Uh, you can actually download it yourself by just clicking download PDF um, and there it is. And so uh, I like this design by Sarah Smith because it's, it's simple. It's kind of what you expect out of a scarf. And I just wanted to kind of zoom in a little bit on, on this intro. Um, the garter stitch when, when we jump into this is just means that every row you're only doing a knit stitch. So um, there are several types of stitches, the main ones being knit and purl, and um, the garter stitch only uses knit. And so it's a really good way to start. It's, I feel like how most people knit their first scarf with garter stitch. Um, and it tells you the skein. So one ball of yarn is called a skein. Uh, this is what they used. They used this brand um, and this weight, but they used a bulkier yarn and you'll see that. Um, this is a, a weight of six. So it's much bulkier than what we've got in these kits. Um, and yes, a US 19 needle. So they, that's even, even larger than this needle that I'm holding, <laughs> holding in my hand. Um, and, and that really gives it that very large chunky look. Um, so again, I would take this as practice with this yarn and, and understand uh, what you're comfortable doing before going out and purchasing something specific for, for a project. Um, and then they'll usually say what types of, of supplies that you'll need. Um, and again, a darning needle is just a tapestry needle and scissors. And they tell you, if you'd like to gauge it out, that you should, you should cast on seven stitches and you should do that for 12 rows. And when you measure it, it'll be four inches by four inches. And when I was starting my sweater that I showed you, my white sweater, um, I realized I had bought the right, the wrong weight. I had the right type of yarn, but mine was a hundred grams for however many yards and theirs was 50 grams for a different number of yards. So I had to actually do about three gauge swatches to make sure that I was gonna knit it out at the correct size. Um, and even then I'm knitting it at a different size that's actually gonna and knitting it at their small, which is actually going to fit me like their medium should. So a lot of math could happen. And so it's good if you really want it to come out uh, as shown to go exactly based on what they suggest or figure out how to get your gauge swatch to match uh, and understand the conversion from, from their number of stitches to your number of stitches. And then they'll give you um, a final measurement. So Again, ours is gonna be different, but they say with this yarn and this, these needles, it's gonna be 21 inches long and seven inches wide. Um, ours will be about half that, generally speaking. Uh, and then most will give you abbreviations. Some of the fancier uh, patterns will not tell you the abbreviations, but um, cast, CO is cast on, BO is bind off, K is knit, K1 TBL is knit the next stitch through the back of the loop and SL1P is slip next stitch purl wise. So I know that that is a lot. Um, I wanted to show you this chart, which I'll also send out um, that I just put together quickly today. Um, but this chart has just uh, what the abbreviation is, what it is, and then a link on YouTube. Um, so you can just and I, I really kind of found these, these videos randomly, but they are good videos that show you how to do each of these, these things. 
um, which can be really helpful. I've learned most of what I know off of YouTube um, or asking people here in the library. Um, but it's good to know and just have one of this, this list of things available just so you get an idea of, of what you're reading. Um, you'll see stitches a lot, STS. A lot of the times you'll see K2TOG where you're knitting two stitches together to decrease. Um, but I did wanna emphasize that while this can look like a whole other language, um, they are difficult ways to describe very simple things. So um, I think it's better if we just start and, um, and see if any questions come up as we do that. So if you've got yarn with you, um, I'm gonna switch this to my hand. Um, the very first thing that we need to do in order to start is to cast on. And to do that, we're actually gonna need uh, to make a slip knot. And so it's uh, one of the easier knots. Um, and if you've not made a slip knot before, I'll, I'll try and do it slow. Um, the way I like to do it is I like to grab the yarn here, leaving a couple inches of a tail. And then I'll wrap it around a finger here. I'm gonna grab this with my uh, other finger over here. And then if I put my fingers here and reach through to grab this yarn and pull it through, that will make a slip knot. And you'll know it's a slip knot because as you pull it, let me see if I can do this in a way that makes sense. As you pull it, the tail will shorten or lengthen. And I'm gonna do that again, um, just to show you and let me know if, if I can do anything to make it easier to see. But I'm gonna take my finger here, I'm gonna twist it, and then I'm gonna grab the yarn and pull it through. So just, just a basic slip knot. And once you have that, and I'm happy to wait a second if anyone has questions, but let me do it one more time. So I'm just gonna take the yarn, twist it, my finger here. I'm gonna put my fingers into there, grab the yarn and pull it through. And that's it. Um, I'm gonna take my needles, whatever size needles, whatever size yarn you have, and just put this knot right onto the needle. And you can tighten it up a little bit. And I like to have the tail, this part that's not attached to the ball of yarn, I like to keep it to the back. So, sorry, if I'm holding my needle like this, then I want this tail to be over here and this tail attached to the ball to be to my right side. The first stitches of a cast on can be the most frustrating. So I'm gonna go slow um, and, and feel free to, to stop me again if you need more demonstration. But um, what you're gonna do to start, you'll see there's a hole here. And when, you, sorry, when we say that we're knitting into the front of the loop, the front is the side that's facing you and the back is the side facing away from you. So I'm going to insert the right hand needle into the front of the stitch. Okay, it's going to look just like that. And then I'm going to make sure I'm grabbing the yarn attached to the ball. I'm going to wrap this around the back of the needle on the right. Hold it tight. And then I'm gonna pull the needle through this hole that's been created there. And it should really, you should don't have to do it this big, but it should really pull from the ball of yarn. I'm gonna do this again, just so you can see. I'm gonna go in through the front. I'm gonna grab the yarn attached to the ball. I'm gonna bring it around the back of the right hand needle, pull it tight. And then there's a little hole that that creates here. I'm gonna just push the point of the right hand needle through it and then pull. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this on the right hand needle and put it back onto the left hand needle and pull it tight. 
So now what you see, I ripped it a little bit, but now you see two stitches. So the first stitch was the one we cat we made with the um, sorry with the knot with the slip knot, and the second one is the one that we just knit. So I'm going to do this again. This this pattern calls for 14 stitches. So when they say CO 14, that means cast on 14 stitches. So I have two, and I'm going to keep going. And feel free to ask questions uh, if you need me to do something different. Let me even try and see. Yeah, okay. So I'm inserting the needle through the front of the loop, taking the working yarn, the one attached to the ball, wrapping it around the right hand needle. That's going to create a hole to our left, and you're going to pull the tip of the needle through it. And then take that and place it on to the left hand needle. And you'll see I'm holding these with my left hand because I've been burned quite a few times. Uh, if, if I'm not holding these first stitches in place, especially with metal needles, there's a chance they just fly right off. Uh, so I'm holding them to both keep the tension and just make sure they don't actually leave my needles. So I'm gonna do this again. I'm gonna enter through the front Grab the working yarn. See, it's very easy to accidentally grab your tail. Grab the working yarn, pull it around, pull through the hole, loosen and put it on. All right, I'm gonna keep going. Does anyone have questions about casting on? There are several ways to do this. This is the most simple way I know how to cast on. But that doesn't mean there aren't plenty of other methods. So I'm going to do a few more here. And you, you don't have to feel like you need to do 14. I'm mostly doing the full 14 because it gives us an option to just watch it happen a few more times. Up and count. <laughs> Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So I have four more to go. Once you get that movement, it is very easy to get into the groove to also forget how many you've done, which I do often. And I think I'm there. One more. Okay, so that is casting on. That's it. Um, we have what is going to be the base of this scarf. And you'll see, again, it's not going to be the same size as the, the pattern, but it is just an, an excellent way to get into it. So I have 14 stitches here. It's easiest to see them from the top, um, but you can see that as I've gone casting on, it's created a really firm line here, and that's what's gonna be the, the bottom of the scarf. Um, that's This is what it looks like on a little bit different yarn. Same thing though. Okay, so with that, if there aren't any questions, um, I think we should just knit. Uh, and the great thing about knitting is that it is exactly the same. So you're going to do the same exact motion as that cast on, but with a little twist at the end. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to take the right hand needle. I'm gonna insert it into the final stitch on my left hand needle. I'm gonna grab the yarn, the one attached to the ball. I'm going to wrap it around the back of the needle, pull through this hole. And instead of putting it back onto the needle on the left, I'm just gonna slip this 
off. It's scary the first time. That is a stitch. This is what a stitch looks like on the right hand needle. So basically what we're doing is we're entering into a stitch on the left. We're grabbing additional yarn. We're pulling that yarn through that hoop and we're passing it onto the second needle. We're literally tying a knot onto the top of the previous knot. And um, so this is what lets us build up. Thank you, Christina. Um, so I'm gonna keep going. Let me know if you have any questions because I'm gonna do this 12 more times. Well, almost 12. We're gonna do a special thing at the end of this row. So again, enter through the front, yarn around the back, pull through and slip that off. Again. Okay. Just wanna be sure. Awesome. Cool. And do the front. Yarn around, pull through, slip off. Can you show us how you're holding the yarn in the right hand to keep the tension even? Yeah, there are there are several ways to do this, and I've been told I I do it uh, differently. But um, a lot of people like to wrap the yarn around their finger like this. And I'd also be interested if anyone in the crowd has a favorite way to hold the yarn. Um, I do what's called I think English style where I throw the yarn from the right hand over to the left. Um, a lot of people knit continental, that's continental European, where they hold it on the left hand and then they'll actually um, pick up the yarn here. I, I'm very bad at it. Um, you go through, you pick up the yarn and you pull it through from the left hand. Um, the way that I've been able to do it well is I hold it fairly tightly around my finger and I I adjust the tension by using my thumb um, on, on the yarn and then holding here to make sure I don't pull the next stitch off and holding tight here, I'll actually, I literally just throw it um, is what it's called. I pinch it and I throw it and tighten. A lot of people don't like the pinch because this is uh, not what I would call ergonomic. Um, so the best way would be to wrap this around your finger and find a way to hold it between your knuckles here. Um, and that way, I'm gonna try it. Um, you can hold it between your knuckles there, that way you're not pinching or creating like a claw, which is what some who watch me have said. Um, but I'm, I'm definitely open to see how other people prefer to hold their yarn, if, if anyone else has suggestions. I don't know, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. The way I do it is I take my little finger and I wrap it around my little finger and that creates a tension. And then I just knit and the tension is, I keep it around my little finger and bring it up here. And then you can just knit and the tension is controlled by your little finger. Okay. So I bring it up around my little finger and then over the, the index finger and then it just creates a tension. Cool. Yeah, so really weaving it through your fingers there to, to force it. Right. To, yeah, I'd really offset to what's comfortable for you. Um, especially for folks with arthritis or just any, any repetitive motion injury. Um, holding it like this is like a, a surefire way to make that worse. Uh, <laughs> so finding a better way to hold, hold it tense. So I'm trying a little bit how you've done that, Kathy. Um, that way you can actually just, and this is how my partner does it too. Um, so it's actually working pretty well. Your little finger and then over so around the little finger and then 
in the back and then up on your index finger. And it's automatically there. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I will be also sharing uh, that resource sheet with all the videos and you'll see there's a, there's a pretty big diversity in the way that people hold their needles um, and, and hold their yarn. So it is really about finding what's comfortable for you. Um, yeah. And I've gotten to my last stitch um, and to, to follow this pattern, they do something a little bit different. Um, and so I've knit these 12. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. I've knit 13, sorry. Uh, and then the final stitch that they say is SL1P, which is slip one stitch purl wise. We haven't done a purl yet, which I'm happy to do after this just to show you. But purl wise essentially means you need your yarn to be in front instead of in back. Uh, purling is essentially the opposite of knitting <laughs> in the sense that when you knit, your, um, your yarn is on the back of the needles, it's behind the needles, and you're knitting into the front and working around the back. When you purl, what you do is you move the yarn to the front and then you enter the front of the yarn wrap the yarn around the front there and pull through. So, so purling is essentially just knitting in the front instead of in the back. When they say to slip one purl wise, then all that means is I need to move the yarn to the front. I need to insert the right hand needle into the front of this stitch and I'm just slipping it. So I'm, I'm just passing it over to the other needle. And I can show you that again. Um, so this, this pattern calls for the slip one purl wise at the very end of every row. And so I'm just going to take my yarn, which was in the back. I'm gonna move it to the front. I'm gonna take my right hand needle. I'm gonna enter the front of this stitch and just pull it off so that it just lives on the right hand. And I can explain why they've chosen to do that. Um, sometimes when you're knitting, you'll start to get a curling happening, especially with stock in it, which is um, knitting, knitting one side all knit and knitting the other side all purl. It tends to start to curl up. You can see on this sweater I'm making, it's very curly. Um, so it's, it's really curling on the sides and that'll get fixed when I sew it. But as I'm knitting, it's really curling up. Some people really don't like that. And one way to stop that from happening while you're knitting is to slip the final stitch on, on a row and then um, the way that they do it is on the next row, they knit one through the back loop to make that flat. That way, uh, as you're knitting, it's not curling up around you. And also it has a flatter texture, especially for a scarf um, that you're not gonna sew. You're not gonna sew the sides together. Uh, it would be, it would look maybe a little uh, interesting if all the sides were curling up. <laughs> It'd probably be a little less comfortable. So doing this on the sides allows that to, um, allows that to not happen. So I'm gonna show you what that knit one through the back loop looks like. And it really is exactly what it sounds like. And this will be the first stitch for the rest of this pattern on every row. I'm just gonna take my needle and instead of entering through the front like we have been, so as we've been doing, you just enter through the front and you knit. Instead, I'm gonna take my needle and I'm gonna enter through the back of that same stitch. So instead of the needle being here, it's just over here. 
an easy way to get there if you're uncomfortable is enter through the front here. Well, sorry. You're gonna go into the front like this. And I just like to spin it around to the back. <laughs> That's all it is, is entering the needle to the back side of that stitch. And then proceeding as normal, I'm gonna grab my yarn. I'm gonna throw it around the back, come through the hole, pull it over. And that's knitting one through the back loop. I'll do it again on this stitch, even though I'm not supposed to. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and do this. I'm gonna enter through the back, grab this, pull it around, pull through the hole, and move it over. It, and then it calls for just regular knit the rest of this row, which again, is entering through the front with the right hand needle, grabbing the yarn on the back, pulling it around, pulling through the hole and pushing it over. I thought it would be beneficial to also show you how to purl um, because that pretty much unlocks all of, well, everything. Um, most, most patterns, are gonna do some mix of knitting and purling. Um, maybe you'll knit a whole row and purl another whole row. Maybe you'll do it alternately. Um, it's also how you do ribbing. So if you want something that looks like this, like the sleeves of many shirts or like the, the bottom of many sweat, sweaters and shirts, um, this is done through a mix of knitting and purling. So I'm just gonna show you what a purl looks like. Um, even though it's not in this pattern. So I'm gonna take my working yarn and I'm gonna move it to the front of my needle. So here I am in front. And then again, I'm gonna grab my right hand needle. I'm gonna enter through the front of this stitch, grab my yarn, pull it around the top of the needle and then find that hole and pull the tip of the needle through it and pass it over. So I'm gonna do that again. And this is purling. I'm gonna grab the right hand. I'm gonna enter through the front. I'm gonna take my yarn and wrap it around the point of the needle and then holding this tight I'm gonna find this hole that opens up right here under the stitch and then pull it off. I'll do one more. So I'm putting my needle through the front, grabbing the yarn, pulling it around the tip and then finding this hole and pushing the needle through it and sliding that off. And then I'll go back to regular knit here. Any questions at the moment? I'm not going to cut yeah, us. Yeah, you. Uh, um, there seems to be two rows, mm -hmm. and the first one says knit across until the last stitch, and the second one does your knit one through and the, mm -hmm. through the back of the loop. But you said that you're gonna start every row knitting one through the back. Yes. But that's not what the pattern says. So let me show you real quick. I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, so it says right here, you'll do row one, which is what we've done here, knit all the way across, slip one purl wise. Row two, just like you said, knit one through the back loop and then knit across into the last stitch and do that slip slip one purl wise again. And then um, you're just gonna repeat row two until you're finished. So um, yeah, so in order oh. to- Oh. <laughs> okay, okay, this is why reading a pattern can be daunting because you think you're doing what it says and then all of a sudden you're halfway right. through and they had a, a trick there uh, and it's not separated out super clearly. Um, so repeating row two will just mean that every single row, I knit one through the back loop, I knit 12, 
and then I slip on pearlwise every single time. Um, knitting through the back loop helps on that. Um, when you slip one pearlwise, let me stop sharing. When you slip one pearlwise, so again, I'm pulling my yarn to the front and then I'm entering through the front here and just pulling it over. Thank you for coming, Natalia. Um, when this is here, you can see the working yarn's not actually attached to this uh, loop. And, and what that can do is leave like holes up the side of the garment. Not that that's bad, um, but it might look loose and floppy. And it might also still curl, kind of depending on how you knit into that. Um, so knitting through the back loop, in my understanding, um, is a way to tighten that hole up in a way that's, that, that won't uh, twist it. If I, if I knit through the front here, you'll see um, that if I were to pull this off, it would twist the stitch and you might get kind of a, it's very, <laughs> you might get kind of a wavy line up the side of the scarf, which would not be life ending. <laughs> uh, it, nothing you can do in knitting is dangerous. It's more, um, a lot of people have very specific preferences for the way that their garment comes out. Um, different cast-ons look different. So whereas I have this cast-on here, this is actually a different type of cast-on that makes it look a little cleaner and also makes it stretchier. Um, although it's a little more complicated to do. And so just depending on the person writing the pattern, depending on what your comfort level is, people have different tricks for making things look just the way they want them to. And, and the way that this person wrote this pattern is by knitting through the back loop, they're able to um, avoid some of that twisting, but also get rid of that, um, that curling issue. Keep knitting. Um, I did want to show people have to, how to bind off before we go today. So I was just going to finish this row um, to demonstrate the bind off. And again, the, I've recorded this, so uh, I'll send out the link uh, likely tomorrow with, with the recording cleaned up a little bit. And that way you can, you can come back to this and, and watch it again, or use any of the YouTube links that I'm adding to that spreadsheet um, to perfect this. But I'm just gonna finish knitting, knitting this row here. And then I'll do what they ask. And I'm actually just gonna knit this final stitch to make the bind off a little easier. So if you've done a couple rows, if you've gotten through a couple rows and it's okay if you haven't, um, spreading it out and looking at it can be fun. This is also why I like the cables. I can just pop them, let me zoom out a little bit. I can just pop them onto the cables and not worry about it falling off. Um, and you'll always know where the where you're supposed to start next because it's attached to the ball of yarn. So I'll know that this one has to be on my left hand needle when I start next. It can be really easy to accidentally uh, start backwards. And then what you're gonna do is basically sew your project into a circle. Um, but you can see a couple of things here. Zoom one more time. Um, you can see the, the, the knit stitch across. And this is what knit stitches look like stacked on top of each other. It's a garter stitch where every row is a knit stitch. You can also see where I started to do some other stuff. Uh, so right here, you can see it's all pretty uniform. And then as you get further to the right, I started doing a little bit of purling and it's giving it a little bit of a different texture. Again, not bad, just different. And I'm gonna show you real quick how to bind off. And that really just means that we're gonna, we're gonna sew this up so that it doesn't fall apart and that it could be a wearable garment. So we're gonna do it just like we would knitting with the knit stitch. We're gonna take the right hand needle 
and enter through the front, grab the working yarn, pull it around, and we're just gonna knit. So I've done one knit, I'm gonna do one more. And then I'm gonna grab this stitch on the far right, and I'm gonna pull it over the top of the needle here, leaving the second stitch alone. What that did was it totally closed off that first stitch. I've essentially sewn it shut. And I'm gonna keep doing this. So um, you'll, you'll knit one so that you have two on the right hand side. And when I have two here, I'll grab the one on the farthest right, pull it over the top of the other stitch over the needle and then pull it tight. And as I do a couple more, you'll start to see we have a pretty finished line there. So again, I'm gonna knit one and I'm gonna grab the far right stitch, pull it over the tip of the needle, leaving that second stitch there. I'm gonna keep going. Let me know if you have any questions or wanna see me do something. You can also grab that first stitch with your other needle. Yes, absolutely. I'm, I'm very bad at it, which is why I'm not doing it, but this is what you can do. You can knit and then you can grab this stitch with your left That's hand needle pull it loose, and then stick your other needle through that hole. It's essentially just using the left-hand needle as your finger. So I'll do that again. I'm gonna knit. And then I'm gonna take my left-hand needle, trying to make this visible. I'm gonna go into this first stitch on the right. I'm gonna stretch it a little bit and pull it and work the tip of my needle in. And there we have it. Yep, same thing as grabbing it and pinching it. And again, more ergonomic. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. I know this is something I'll have to do within a couple of years if I keep knitting the way I do. So it's good to get in the habit of doing it in a way that's a little better for my hands. So again. So you'll come up with different, different stress points. Um, for me, it can be really hard to work a bigger needle like this through a stitch and um, just hard to get the point in. And you'll find that that's also true when you have bigger needles, but the pointier they are, obviously the easier they're gonna get into the, the needle. But that being said, when they're really small, it can be very tedious um, also to, to get the needles into the yarn. So I definitely recommend, the reason I put several sizes in those kits is just so you can play around with um, how it feels to knit with different size needles, uh, what, make, what makes you feel more comfortable, what you like the look of also. I'm just gonna do this last two and you'll see Okay, so this is my final one. I've got my last two stitches, nothing super special. I'm gonna grab this stitch, pull it over the top. I'm left with one stitch. I'm gonna loosen it up. And then, wow, I didn't bring scissors. So let me just rip this real quick. Okay, I'm gonna cut my yarn. Uh, I like to leave, let me, I like to leave at least a few inches, depending on the size of the thing you're working on, but just a couple of inches so that you have something to sew with. And now that I've got this loop, I'm just gonna take the end of the yarn, put it through that loop and pull it tight. And here's the magic. It's tight and it's done. So I've made a very fancy bookmark. <laughs> uh, which is also a great project. 
trying out different little stitches and um, making fun little bookmarks. But you can see that it's totally done. Um, no matter how I pull or tug on it, it's knotted. So it's not gonna come apart easily. I could rip it. I think the yarn, this, this is, um, I think it's alpaca yarn. It rips pretty easy. Um, but yeah, so the acrylic probably won't rip. Um, so I would definitely grab some scissors so you might burn your hand a little bit, um, but that's done. And if you have a big scarf or you have something like, um, I'm just gonna show you this. Like I've finished this, let me see if, wow, that's awful. Uh, if I've finished, wow, so many options. This here, it's just so not visible. Let me show you here. On the back side of this headband, um, I've sewn in through the back and then just tied a little knot. So you can actually see the seam that I've made here. Uh, and really you just take the rest of that tail, work it through the back so it's not visible on the front and then tie another little knot. That way it's just not gonna fall apart on you. And I can show you just real quick what that looks like. Did anyone have any questions? Awesome. Um, I do actually. So I'm, I'm working with pretty big needles just cause I wanted to kind of get a better idea of what I was doing and it was hard. It was going to be hard for me to, I didn't have the needles. I had an eight and then I had a nine. So, I'm, or no, I'm sorry, this is a 13. So I'm working with the 13, but what I'm finding is that, and it's interesting, um, the tip of the needle is super narrow, but the base of the needle is super wide. And so I'm having a hard time maintaining the tension. So I have these giant holes <laughs> that are coming up at the end, right? I don't know if you guys can see it. And then I think wherever I'm losing tension, I'm getting holes. And so it's kind of looking really loosey and maybe it's supposed to look like that because have, I'm using such large needles, but I'm just wondering, been, is that normal? Yeah. Um, have you been doing the slip one pearl wise? Yeah. On so that yeah, is so, what that is supposed to look like. Okay. Cause oh. I'm getting like even holes on either side from yeah. the knit one, one pearl. But so it's just, happened, it's kind of looking more loose than I was expecting. And maybe that's just because of the gauge of the needle. I don't no, know. That, that is what's supposed to happen. You can kind of see it on this. It's not super clear, but the, um, when you slip one, mm -hmm. essentially what you're doing is you're not, you're not pulling the working yarn through. So, so that stitch is missing a line. Across yeah, the exactly. Yeah. So I'm getting these giant loops at the end. <laughs> That is that is the style. Um, okay, you, all right. You look at the finished scarf. Um, it it is supposed to have that kind of that kind of feel. It'll okay. have a little bit little bit of a, a bigger hole on the side, but you are right. Um, as you knit and have different tension, I'll see if I can find a quick example. It's very funny because me and my partner uh, maybe I'll say, "Hey, can you knit a couple rows of my scarf? I don't want to work on it or whatever." Um, she knits very loose and I knit very tight. And so mm. you, you can notice just by looking at it, who did what section, uh, which is why we don't collaborate on a lot of projects. Cause I just, I can't help, but yeah. knit very tight. It's just, that it's a problem for me. Um, but you can see like, this is, let me switch this camera real quick. Um, there are little sections and they're not going to be noticeable to the general public but to knitters, <laughs> um, you can see that these rows here are all pretty similar. And then you get like a little bit of extra space. Maybe I'm just, maybe I just feel like I can see it, but you get a little bit of extra space mm. between the rows here. So like these specifically look a little bit bigger okay. than the ones around it. And, and that is something you'll just fight with. Um, just learning how to keep that tension getting into a rhythm uh, is really, it's practice. Yeah. Practice. Okay. So it's just practice then. All right. Cause right now I was kind of looking at it and I'm like, God, that's like really loose. And, and I, I have a feeling it has to do with the size of the, 
13 needle that, you know, I have. So that is, that's a pretty good, and it's a great example, actually, if you want to hold it a little closer to the camera, um, it's a great example of what a garter stitch looks like. Generally, it's all those very um, distinct rows of knit. Uh, basically, when you knit, uh, do a knit stitch, it pops the, the knot to the other side of the garment. And so when you do that every row, it means that on both sides, you'll have that same wavy pattern of yeah. things popping out. Um, when you do stock in it, where you knit one row and purl another row, that's when you get the smoother rows. And then I'm doing the reverse on those lines so that it pops out on one side. It makes this side look like um, blocks, basically. But uh, it's going to take, <laughs> it's definitely patience because I find myself, the one thing that I, I think I'm going to be afraid of is if I get like way up here and I've got a bigger thing and I drop a knit and don't realize that I drop it. So then how do yeah. I recover? <laughs> um, there's, there's a way to recover it. Uh, sorry, I shouldn't have, uh, I shouldn't have bind it off because I can show you um, if you'd like to stick around, I'm happy to show you quickly what that looks like. Um, okay. Because, and that's, that's something I didn't, I neglected to think of was dropping stitches, which we're all gonna do um, at some point, either because you just missed it or it fell off the needle as you were pulling to tighten the other, to tighten the stitch that you're doing. Um, it's just inevitable that you'll drop stitches. It's also why it's important to um, count. <laughs> Everyone... well, and, then, and then I think the other question that I had is, does it matter which direction like when you're at the end and mm -hmm. you're doing just the slipping over of the last knit, right? You bring the yarn over and then you slip over the last knit. Does it matter which direction it's facing? Like, could it be this way or could it be the other way? Cause I've done that before <laughs> and I don't know which way is, does it matter? Uh, which way you slip it on? Yeah. Does it matter which way it faces or doesn't it matter? I don't the know. short answer is no, uh, it, it really doesn't. Um, okay. The long answer is if you want it to look like the pattern, yes. Okay. Um, the way that a stitch is twisted won't have structural issues. It'll be a look, right? Oh, so, it'll be an aesthetic thing, so, okay. Yeah, so like if I drop a stitch and I'm gonna show you here, um, I just cast on a few here. Uh, if I drop a stitch, then um, even if I pick that up, I could pick it up and accidentally um, twist it the wrong way. Mm -hmm. You'll see it, even though you won't, it won't matter necessarily, like your thing's not gonna fall apart if you picked it up. Uh, you will see that one stitch is maybe uh, like facing the other way. Got it, okay. Again, and you would, you, but you wouldn't know necessarily, well, for me as a, a complete beginner, I wouldn't necessarily notice it until I was further up and yes. then you'd have to unravel it to get, okay, got it. <laughs> I'll just show you, um, and I see your comment there. Thank you, Kathy, for coming. I am gonna email out a survey. So look forward to that if you're interested in knitting more together. Um, so I'm gonna drop a stitch real quick and I'm gonna show you what that looks like on the following row. So I've just cast on a few here. Well, that's not focused, so that's not helpful. Okay, so I've just cast on a few here. Um, I'm gonna knit a couple and then maybe as I'm knitting, I pull this too hard and it pulls that whole other stitch off and I keep going. And then I realize once I've finished this row that I don't have the right number of stitches. I have five, not six. If I look, if I spread this out and I look, I am gonna notice, I'm gonna notice when I get a little bit closer, um, that something is off right here where I dropped that. And let me just get there real quick and show you. It can be really unforgiving on the first few rows because it's it doesn't take very long for it to get down to the bottom and just fall apart. Um, but let me do this real quick. Okay, so right here, you can see that there's a big gap right here. Um, and if I were to pull it harder, this will actually just come all the way undone. 
and it's a really easy way to lose a whole project. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to try and do this. This, this right here, this whole, sorry, I'm trying to differentiate it from other stuff. This here is the stitch I dropped. And again, it's, you have to pay kind of close attention to what, let me zoom. Um, you have to pay kind of close attention to what everything looks like. Like what does a regular stitch look like all the way down? And then if I look and I see this big empty gap, especially right here, this hole, I can grab, and it's sometimes easier to do this with a third needle, but I can grab this right here, this little bump, and I can thread the yarn. So if this is my bar here, I don't know what, I don't know the best word to call it. I've got a bar of yarn here, I've got a hole, and then I've got this little bump here. If I can get this bar through that bump like that, then I can just place that back on the left side and then knit it. So now I've got this new stitch. It still might leave a hole depending on how you pull it up, but it's at least safe. And I've got this stitch that I can then work again. And that'll get me my six back. Um, and the way that's gonna look when it's finished, you'll see, I probably didn't do a world's best job of picking it up, but I at least know that I've grabbed something from below. I've attached it to the yarn going across and put it back on. So it's at least not gonna fall apart. It is <laughs> gonna leave that like octagon hole right there. Um, and the way to fix that on the next row, again, this is something to play with aesthetically. Um, when I get to that stitch again, and it's good to remember, so I know I knit three on one side. Um, but when I get here again, what I can do is I can grab this here from underneath and again, attach it here and pull it up. Um, or, you know, you can, you can practice just pulling from a different place down below and attaching it again to that yarn going across um, and see what it looks like. You can, you can kind of weave these together. And like if I pull from down here. You're just trying to close the hole basically. You're just trying to close the hole. So if I grab this one and feed that through it, I, I chose the wrong yarn to demonstrate this, sorry. And then I can pull that one again up through the next level. It would at least close it, but it might not look perfect. Um, I know a lot of, a lot of very serious, very serious knitters uh, when they've got, when they've realized that they've dropped a stitch. Even if you go, you know, even if I drop a stitch all the way down here and I need to pull it up, which I did do a couple times, I don't think I'm gonna be able to stare at this and find it, but um, even if I have to pull it up three or four rows, a lot of knitters will say, I, I can't make that look like the pattern. So I'm just gonna start over. And I've watched, yeah, I know several people who have undone full, almost full shirts or sweaters or other projects because they just, they don't want that imperfection. For me, uh, kind of the whole, the whole vibe of it is that it's, it's handmade. Um, if I'm gifting it to someone, they better enjoy it. Uh, but, you know, this is for my partner and it's not perfect. There's a couple, there's a couple things on here that I notice that no one walking by would, would notice. So if it's comfortable and it's not falling apart, I, I like to just continue. <laughs> but yeah, there is a way to close that hole um, or to do it as a style. So every time you get there each time, uh, you could drop the stitch and pull up from, the, from below it and create another hole. That's basically what lace work is, uh, is making fancy holes. Another way to do it is to yarn over. So as you're knitting, um, you, if you have the yarn on your needle, um, you take your working yarn, you pull it over without feeding the needle through the next, um, the next stitch. 
So you pull the yarn over and this is, there's a link to this in that sheet also. Um, and then with that yarn over the top, you then knit the next stitch. So that creates an extra stitch, except it also leaves a hole right where you did that yarn over. So if you knew after the third stitch each time you wanted that lacy look up the top, you could do a yarn over after three every time. And then after you've knit one, you can knit the next two together. Um, that way you end up with the same number of stitches uh, and a little bit of lace work. <laughs> and yes, Carol, I can show you one more time how to do that. Let me I do it on this big yarn. Um, so the combination of, of yarn over and uh, knitting two together is really excellent for, for lace work, <laughs> for adding those little, um, those little holes here and there. Obviously it's better if you can plan it. So it's fun to make charts or just remember like every fourth stitch, I'm gonna do a yarn over and then I'm gonna knit two together. Um, and then you'll get some really fun little patterns. And let me just do this real quick. Okay, I'm gonna switch cameras. Okay, so let me do a row real quick for you, Carol, and then I'll show you. Okay, so I've done this first row here and I'm on the last stitch. So to slip one purl wise, I'm going to take my working yarn and I'm gonna put it in front of the needle instead of in back. And then I'm gonna take the right hand needle and insert it through the front of the stitch on the left hand and just pull it off the needle. That stitch lives here without actually doing a knit. And then when I come to this side, I flipped it around. I'm gonna grab the working yarn. It's easier if it's on the right side. Okay. I'm gonna take my knit, my, sorry, my right hand needle, and I'm gonna enter through the back of the hoop. So let me do that again. Right hand needle through the back of this stitch. Then I'm gonna grab the yarn and knit just like I would around the back of that needle. Pull through that hole and then pull that off. And let me um, zoom out real quick. So that's easier to see because I keep moving out of the frame. And I'm gonna do that again. Been knitting with the smaller needles this whole time. So now the big ones feel all bulky. Okay. So I'm gonna grab the working yarn and pull it to the front. Then I'm gonna grab my right hand needle, enter through the front of the loop and just pull it off. That's slipping one purl wise. The purl wise is essentially just the combination of the yarn in front and going through the front of that loop. Then when I flip it back over to this side, to the next row, I'm gonna take my right hand needle. I'm gonna enter through the back of that first stitch. And then I'm gonna grab the working yarn oops, and knit like normal. So around the back and pull through that hole and pull that stitch off. Did that work? Did you need to see it again? That's great, thank you very much. I know we're at 4.30, so does anyone have any questions? Um, so if we were to follow this pattern, it's just working with 14 stitches, right? And mm -hmm. just keep going until you hit um, 42 inches, is that it? Yeah, and there's a good chance you won't get 42 inches with, with the yarn from the kit, but if you're working with your own yarn, um, I, bet, I bet you will. <laughs> um, okay. With bigger, with, sorry, with smaller 
yarn, you might end up needing more uh, more yardage of yarn to hit to hit the um, forty two inches. And and this is just going to make a long skinny scarf. Is that it? Yeah, essentially. And okay. and what they're going to tell you to do at the end. Um, let me just I'll just put the pattern up real quick. Uh, what's gonna, what they're going to tell you to do at the end is um, sew together the last two rows or the first row and the last row to make it an infinity scarf. You obviously don't have to sew it together, but to make it an infinity scarf, what you're doing is you're you're just sewing the front and the, the beginning and the end together. So you take uh, your tapestry needle and I can demonstrate that too. Um, I think, where did I? Sorry, now I've got a table full of yarn. Um, you, you just take this. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you for coming. Um, to sew two ends together. So I've put my um, needle, I've attached my needle to my tail here on my finished product. Let's call this a miniature version of the scarf. Um, since it's attached, it's, I don't need to attach it in a second place. What I'll do is I'll take both ends. So this is one end and this is the other. I'll stick them together like that. And then I'm literally just gonna sew them together. So I'll take my needle, put it through the other side. And then uh, you can choose the type of stitch you do. I like to go back underneath. So there's not like a, I don't like to do it in a loop so that there's like a very obvious um, seam. So go back in through that same side and attach it to the other side again. And as this is so small, I only have to do it a couple of times, but you'd have to do it about 14 times since your thing is 14 stitches wide. And then once it's all sewn together, right? Like this is already, this is an infinity scarf for a mouse. And that's it. You can, uh, I would tie these together, maybe the two tails just to have it tight. And then um, depending on the way your seam looks, and I'll show you what this looks like, totally done. Um, you can weave it in a little bit just so it's woven in. And then I would actually sew it on the inside. So, so if I've sewn it here to finish, I'm just gonna flip it inside out. That way the seam isn't as visible and I'm assuming I would have woven in all of these ends and cut them. So um, you don't actually see the, the sewing really. Yeah, so if you know that you have a front side and a back side, it's good to turn it inside out or turn it on the side that you don't want the public to see and then do all of your sewing and your um, weaving in on that side. And then when you flip it inside out or to the other side, uh, they only get to see the pretty side. Awesome. Are there any any other questions? Thanks everyone for hanging out a bit longer than this was planned. I don't, I don't know a fast way to talk about knitting, I guess. <laughs> so are we, are you going to be doing this like on a regular basis or what's the next, I'm just trying to understand if you're going to go over more patterns or am I, so, am I on my own now? <laughs> so I'll, I'll put it this way. You're, you're ready to go. Um, it, it looks like you've figured it out, which is awesome. Um, I think the hardest part that you're going to hit now is binding off, which again, there's, there's videos and lots of resources for that. I would love to do a, maybe like a monthly knitting program where people just come together and, and knit. Um, we can choose a pattern as a group or um, a type of stitch or whatever it is, because there's lots of different ways to combine knitting and purling to make it look really cool, um, including like the, the very famous like Gansey that uh, are in Gansey's, like the Irish sweaters. Um, there's a lot of really fun techniques that can be learned in an hour or two. So I'm very, I'm very open to that. Um, I'm gonna send out, I just made a Google form with our library Gmail. Um, I'm gonna send that out to everyone who registered today. So, so respond to that. Let me know days and times that you're generally available. 
And then, um, yeah, I'll try to get it going. It seems like there's interest. So it'd be really fun to do that. If anyone else has any questions, happy to answer them or um, yeah. All right, thank you everybody for coming. Thank you again, Silicon Valley Reads. Uh, please look at all of their programs on siliconvalleyreads.org. Really great lineup this year and um, just really enjoyable to be able to connect this way online. So thank you so much, everybody. Have a great day.